delighted to introduce our next speaker, Sharon Turner. In her varied career, she has worked in academia, as a government legal advisor in Northern Ireland, and is also an editorial board member of the Journal of Environmental Law and Environmental Policy in Governments. Sharon is the Climate and Energy Programme Leader at Kleinart, and she's our second speaker from Kleinart here today. She's also a visiting professor at UCL and the University of Sussex. Kleinart is, of course, an NGO that many of you know about. It seeks to protect the environment through advocacy, litigation, and research. Many of you will also be aware of the recent Supreme Court case brought by Planet Earth on air pollution against the UK government. In the environmental crisis we face, it is not only corporations who are major actors. So it is without further ado that I welcome Sharon, who will talk about the role of a dedicated legal NGO in environmental protection. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I suppose in terms of giving you a, a flavour of the, what, I, what I intended to do in my talk today was first of all to talk, I suppose generally about the role of an NGO in environmental protection and also to explain why a legal NGO, I suppose what our particular role is and our mission and, and what our particular value is. Well obviously NGOs are part of the huge constellation of actors all involved in the process of environmental protection. And in the course of my career, I have engaged with NGOs in many different ways. Um, I have been a career academic for many years in Belfast and was actively involved in using my research to enable NGOs in Ireland, North and South to make complaints to the European Commission, um, to advocate uh, public positions, to, as well to challenge. Then, as um, the introduction mentioned, I then moved into government. I was invited to become the head of legal services for the Department of the Environment in Northern Ireland, where I then was lobbied by NGOs. Um, and then I found myself, um, I suppose, then moving actually to an NGO. So I find myself on the other side of the table. So in a way, I think NGOs have been calling me one way or another um, for a long time. And I started working with Client Earth in June. So it's been I'm in a sense speaking to you after one year essentially working for a dedicated legal NGO and will give you, if you like, my reflections on its value and the process. I think one of the interesting things, I mean, I suppose in terms of giving you a little bit of background about Client Earth, um, Client Earth is very, very new to the UK, it's indeed it's new to Europe. Um, there are about 60 lawyers working in Client Earth. They are based over three different locations London, Warsaw, and Brussels. Um, and they're basically divided into five major working groups. I lead the climate and energy team, then you have the biodiversity team, who are sense marine specialists, um, then you have the air team, who have received a lot of uh, public coverage um, in London, certainly in the last few months, and um, the toxics team, and the forests team, who are essentially a global team. So despite its very young age, we have, I suppose, developed quite a strong group of lawyers who have started, in a sense, to establish proof of concept that legal NGOs do have a distinctive contribution to make, despite the fact that, I, as I'll talk in a few minutes, it's actually been, I think, something that's been quite difficult to explain to the outside world. I think many, certainly in the NGO community, did not necessarily um, accept that a legal NGO had a, a distinctive um, value to offer. And I think it's interesting, in terms of how NGOs function and what their value is. A lot of the different, I mean, and, and there's, there's a huge, as was what I began to realize, even sitting in the university world, specializing in environmental law, I thought I understood the NGO world very well in the environmental field, but it isn't until one enters that field and enters that world that you begin to realize just the enormous variation that there is between them, and that those variations stem fundamentally from very different concepts of change how NGOs should function in that space, and also where their money comes from. And I think it's, it's, it's those two big differences that define how an NGO functions and what sort of impact it's seeking to have. Now, I suppose if you were to take, in terms of the client earth, we're obviously a specifically dedicated legal NGO. We are focusing on using the power of law to mobilize the power of law in the public interest to develop better environmental laws or to make sure that existing environmental laws are enforced. We have no public membership. Uh, we have a much lower public profile than many of our counterparts. And our money comes essentially from 
expert foundations and from private individuals. So we are quite different in a sense from, for example, Greenpeace, who have a very, their concept of change is based on a very confrontational, highly public role. Um, their money, I think, never comes from government, uh, and they have a huge public membership, which determines how they function, how they plan, and how they campaign. But groups do work very closely together also. I mean, despite our great variations and the very sharp elbows that exist within the NGO world about territory and, and ownership of issues, groups do come together and I think co-align very interestingly. But I suppose what is fascinating to me in the NGO world is how positions are also worked out. And I think one of the issues that we're working on at the moment with Greenpeace concerns the UK's energy market, the electricity market reform process, and what is it that should be challenged in that space. Um, as lawyers, uh, we are keen to see the energy transition occurring in Europe, as is Greenpeace. But Greenpeace is taking a very purest technology-specific position on that, and are very much pro-renewables and anti-nuclear. So they are very keen to challenge the Hinkley, uh, the state aid for Hinkley which we are more cautious about, but we are very interested in the UK's capacity mechanism, and we're in a sense working out with Greenpeace what is the best strategic intervention to make. And I suppose the, the, the value of a dedicated legal NGO, I mean, most of the NGOs that you come across in Europe and across the world all employ at least one lawyer, if not a few lawyers. What is different about Planet Earth is just the sheer concentration on law. That Everybody in the staff is a lawyer, bar one or two people. And that concentration, I can certainly see myself, and it's what attracted me to Client Earth, is that you have a tremendous depth of expertise and also the capacity to develop a sustained position on something. You can use law. Law is a long-term game. It's not going to be a quick win in the media. The, 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 the role of law in environmental protection in terms of advocacy is really a kind of a trench warfare, and it requires a very concentrated, expert, sustained <coughs> function. And that is ultimately, I think, what Client Earth is able to bring. And it's also able to bring a very mixed economy of campaigning approaches, both, you've in a sense, seen on the air quality side, where we will use the sharp tool of litigation, but also a very wide range of styles of campaigning. The, the insider campaigning that goes on within Client Earth is very invisible, but the process of bringing expertise to bear, particularly legal expertise to bear, on policy discussions, advocating on a one-to-one -one basis with European officials, with government officials at national level, and doing that in strategic jurisdictions across Europe is incredibly impactful. And also helping other NGOs to mobilize the power of law much more effectively. Um, one of our key missions is not only to be an actor ourselves, but it is to help the sector to act. And I know sitting there, Richard, uh, when James was first setting up Client Earth, I know he did a tour of all the, the experts in the UK, and I know that Richard was one of the, the many people he spoke to. And it was interesting, really, how much caution there was uh, about whether Client Earth would ever work, even though in the US, you have, for example, the Nat National Resource and Defense Council, um, EDF. Um, there are several organizations in America, but NRDC is the big one, where law <coughs> is an accepted tool of campaigning on the environment. But it really had never been done in the concentrated way that Client Earth does it. And I think six to seven years later, Client Earth is beginning to show the added value that this work brings. And I think to give you some examples of this, I mean, Within my team, I, I run a team of 17 lawyers, essentially. And I think one of the most interesting parts of the team I run exists in Poland. And Poland is a country, it's a new European country, with enormous indigenous resources of coal, a uh, highly sensitive history in terms of its relationships with potential importing countries on energy, with Russia and Germany. Poland's political mission is to be independent and to be successful, and energy is at the heart of that mission. <coughs> Poland joined the EU determined to do two things. One, to exploit its coal reserves, 
and two, to stop European ambitions towards climate governance, towards more effective climate laws. The team in Poland, seven lawyers, came together in our Polish office, and they have, over a period of six to seven years, launched a sustained campaign of litigation using very traditional legal tools challenging the environmental impact assessment, the strategic environmental impact assessment, IPPC permits, all the standard, if you like, legal tools were used to basically strategically identify major new coal investments across Poland, which they have successfully done, but they have taken an enormous personal risk in doing so because energy independence is so critically important um, to Poland itself. So when I joined my colleagues in Warsaw and began to, I mean, to me, the, I suppose, Second World War was something I had read about essentially in a book, but moving, when I went to Warsaw, I spent long periods of time with my colleagues there and internalized how, how determined the Polish government was to, <coughs> to use coal and how critically important it was politically for them and economically for them to do so, and how courageous these people have been in challenging that use, and using the only tool that was available to do it, because many others, Greenpeace and several other organizations in Poland had tried to make the same arguments politically and economically, but were just being ignored. And it was really the use of law, and particularly litigation, that has successfully forced not only the stopping of, I think, 14 major new coal power stations in Poland, but also the very substantial diversion of state aids away from new coal in Poland. <coughs> and more fundamentally, what law is doing in Poland now, what legal advocacy is doing, is it's shaping a, the beginning of a new public debate. It, in a, the, the first few years of our work in Poland was very much using a very antagonistic tool, and the headlines in Poland were extremely negative about climate change. We were being accused to be eco-terrorists, um, there were death threats. I was really quite shocked when I discovered what some of my colleagues experienced in Poland. But they are now leading a new social debate in Poland about where Poland's energy future lies, and indeed what Poland's role in Europe is. And we are working now quite closely with the Polish government as Europe goes into the 2030 debate, it's now well established, that team is trying to develop a more modern discourse in Poland about indigenous gas, about renewables, and about Poland's position in Europe and indeed in the world. And that has occurred within that window of six years, and it has been essentially and really exclusively legal advocacy has achieved it. And they have also won and standing for the first time, the, the Polish Supreme Court a month ago in six joint cases accepted for the first time what we regard as commoner garden in the UK and Ireland that NGOs should have a right of standing, that environmental justice is part of um, the, the normal arrangements for environmental governance. That was entirely new to the Polish context and has been established for the first time um, by Planet Earth in a series of cases taken very recently. So I suppose Poland is, in terms of showing impact and showing what the value of a dedicated and sustained legal effort is, Poland is a very graphic example of it. But other parts of the team, um, the, the EU part of the team, or the, the, the EU facing part of the team, there are another six or seven lawyers working in that area. And they are essentially doing two things. They are focusing on shaping the 2030 debate. The 2030 debate at the moment has been focused almost entirely on the need for credible targets, but almost no discussion about whether the legal regime, whether Europe has a governance regime that can actually deliver these targets, and how the governance regime should be modelled. And Client Earth is beginning to lead a debate now calling for a European Climate and Energy Act, that we need something much more integrated, much more sophisticated, and ultimately more flexible to enable the European energy transition to occur. And Having, I can even see myself having a group of lawyers who can engage across the whole NGO community with the European Commission, with the European Parliament, with national governments. We work very much in partnership with organizations like E3G, with RAP, with Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, WWF, in developing a strategic message that is interdisciplinary 
expert and ultimately is reaching all of the key actors across Europe. And we're also beginning to use competition law much more effectively, I think, now. And that is becoming a fascinating area as the new competition guidelines, new state aid guidelines on energy and the environment published, I think, just yesterday. Uh, we have been actively engaged in trying to influence the guidelines. And we will be working very intensively to monitor how the guidelines are used and applied and how member states notify them. And the UK <coughs> capacity mechanism now is one of the first big test cases of that. And we're working very actively to look at how the calculation of capacity in the UK has been analysed and whether it's based sufficiently on a sharing of energy resources with European neighbours. And the other area, I mean, Elspeth has already spoken to this morning about the work we're doing, and she's also within the, the climate and energy team working on climate liability that's very focused on the corporation. But that, that is, I think, I won't repeat that because you've already heard that. But the other area of work I would just mention to you that we're working on is is the European internal energy market, which really other NGOs don't work on. The internal energy market is the key to energy, to energy decarbonization in Europe. In terms of the least cost route for Europe to rationalize the use of fossil fuels and optimize renewables, completing a liberalized and integrated internal energy market is critical. But it's an area of activity and policy that NGOs simply have not worked on. We are now moving into that space much more assertively and are developing an analysis that's based on competition rules and also based looking at an analysis on the extent to which national energy regulators across Europe are sufficiently independent as part of the European regime to actually do their job properly. And also looking at the state of unbundling of all the major TSOs across Europe. To what extent is the market actually functioning? And what we're observing is that the European Commission is taking one, if not several, cases against every single European member state, but these cases are progressing incredibly slowly. And if the market is to be completed within a time frame that is meaningful to the climate challenge, it is essential that civil society enters that space, and Client Earth is the classic operator to do that. And we are now actively fundraising to develop a litigation capacity to take some of the cases that really the European Commission has been unwilling to take, and I think probably <coughs> from a political point of view, unable to take. And that is just simply speaking about the work that's going on within the climate team, the, the energy team. I could spend another half an hour, three quarters of an hour, talking about the work that's going on across the rest of climate Earth. But what I certainly can observe as an academic is that for those of you who have an interest in enabling your research to have impact, there is almost no better, no better organization to collaborate with than Planet Earth. Because in terms of taking strong legal analysis and mobilizing it, it is an organization that's incredibly comfortable and able to do that. And I think it's increasingly becoming more and more expert at that. And I think in terms of the, the value of dedicated legal advocacy, while we are still struggling ultimately to explain ourselves to our NGO peers and to our funders, and to the outside world, what you can certainly see is that in a very short space of time, having a concentrated, sustained, and expert exertion of legal tools <coughs> is definitely having an impact in several fields. So I'll maybe leave, I'll maybe ask you to, invite you to ask questions, but um, that hopefully gives you an overview. your very, very interesting talk. And now we're going to take some questions from the floor. So as always, I will be the one. Uh, so Joe, can you go to that? So Maria first. Hello, I'm, I'm Maria Lee from UCL. Oh. I, I was really interested by what you're saying about trying to open up the internal market for energy. <coughs> it, are there any risks about national subsidies of renewable sources? I'm just wondering about the concern that Germany will no longer be able to subsidise just German renewables. Uh, I just wonder what you well, well, this is an enormously sensitive question, and certainly there's a concern made up with it. Our, we have two state aid lawyers who are actively focused on that question, and there is a deep concern that state aid that has been published are essentially orientated purely to, to facilitate Germany in some respects. The difficulty, I suppose, at, at the heart of the debate in, in Brussels about the renewables question is, first of all, that you have these nationally binding targets that have driven a huge 
drive to renewables in Germany that has, on one level, been the shining star of, of Europe, but has led to all sorts of distortions across the market, and also, particularly, for example, between Poland and Germany, um, partly for political reasons, partly because the grid doesn't, doesn't exist to support renewables yet. The, there isn't a governance arrangement within Europe that can properly manage coordinated energy planning across Europe. Because the Lisbon Treaty <coughs> is a very, very, to my mind, novel and very uneasy sharing of power between the Commission and the Member States, you can see there's an incredibly tense and very ineffective relationship between the Member States and the Commission in terms of how they will manage the energy transition together. And I think that our argument is certainly that new governance needs to be brought to bear to try and, and, and answer that question. And I think the concern is that the Commission is weak politically, uh, member states are not happy with Europe, and there will be a resiling into competition law uh, that the, the Commission will use its competition jurisdiction to control that process rather than having a much more holistic discussion with member states about how the renewables transition should occur collectively across Europe and in concert with other energy investments. Now, I know if we had our state aid lawyers here, they would answer the question in much more specific terms, but I hope that gives you... But you, you you're, you're advocating for more liberalisation. Well, we're, we're, we're arguing for more liberalisation, but with the proviso that in the context of, for example, the consumer, we have also done a lot of work on the extent to which law is, with the internal energy market is sufficiently supportive of communities and individuals as consumers in the energy context. And we looked at, we looked at several comparative <coughs> jurisdictions around Europe on that. And certainly we would argue that pure liberalism is a problem in that context because the grid doesn't serve them well. And when you look at countries like Denmark where the grid is run in the public interest and not for profit, it has had a very different um, relationship to the consumer. So we are certainly arguing that the the European key on climate and energy is very, very mismatched. That the internal energy market framework emerged <coughs> for one purpose, and then the climate agenda was grafted on top of it, and they don't sit well together. Although the internal energy market, having one, having that completed system, will hugely, um, the, the cost benefits are just phenomenal. If, you, if one is to accept the economic analysis that's been published by the European Commission, um, and indeed by others. It's in the order of hundreds of billions over the course of the transition. So it's essential that we have energy sharing, <coughs> but it's a question of how that is done. Okay, thank you. And is the lady behind you? Hi, my name is Amal Shafi. I'm from Sydney University University. I'm the analyst by uh, Energy Group. So my question is, you said that you worked actively with regard to the new guidelines of state aid. <coughs> Just can you tell us uh, more about uh, your contributions, specifically regarding the feed-in tariff and the ETS? Well, what I can say at the moment is that we, the work is very new. Um, the, to, the, to the extent to which we have worked on state aid, we've worked on the Polish context in particular, where we were challenging the granting of state aid to new code. But, and, and the ETS argument was part of that, although I wasn't close to that work. The, the new state aid work, we've just literally, I mean, part of the, the struggle I have had as the head of the team has been to persuade major global funders that competition rules and state aid rules in particular are a critical tool of, of forcing change and, and making effective challenges. So in the year that I've, since I've joined Hydra, I have been out raising the money to, to create those posts, and those lawyers now are literally starting as we speak. And what I spent last week doing was in Berlin, dealing with our key partners and the European Climate Foundation, agreeing a course of action, how we would use state aid rules in much more detail. And basically the analysis, I mean, I, I can't answer the specific question because our specialists, if you like, aren't here with me today, but the analysis is essentially to make sure that what are extremely vague guidelines, as I understand it, the new guidelines leave a huge amount of room to manoeuvre. And what we also understand is that DG competition, the Cabinet had to make a, had to give a vote to adopt the state aid guidelines. It wasn't by uh, consensus. So there is deep disagreement within the Commission about how the guidelines should operate on the energy question. And our intention is essentially
essentially to <coughs> develop a close monitoring process to see how the Commission is using its jurisdiction and whether and how member states are notifying. Um, and I suppose I'm not really in a position myself in terms of the technical side of it to answer a detailed question, but would be very happy to discuss it with you further if you wish to. Okay, thank you very much for your question. And I'm afraid this will be the last question. So Given, given the, the fact that uh, we've heard and we know that uh, the third world is, is certainly the place where not only are the people in those countries exploited, but also the place where the, the Western, essentially Western uh, economy makes its profits from by the exploitation of, of its people and the destruction of its habitat. Do you yourself see uh, any scope for your organization actually Rather than messing around, if I may put it, in, in Europe, which is all very safe, uh, why, why aren't you involved in, in, in actually being where you are actually needed, so that you can protect those countries? And then why aren't you engaging in China? Well, that's it. I, I know if our chief executive was sitting here, he'd be saying, take us there. Uh, <laughs> our board, I suppose, it's ultimately a question of, of, of time. Client Earth began in in London, and James, I suppose, in terms of the history of the organisation, James came from the NRDC stable, and they are genuinely global. We set ourselves up in London, and we have now, in a sense, developed a kind of a, a European focus. The forest team are global. The forest team work in several African countries, but they are working in Africa through a European mechanism, through the European timber regulation process, on making sure that that regulation as timber is coming into Europe, um, that African countries are regulated properly and <coughs> African communities and citizens are able to engage with the rules to advocate. But I completely take your point, and I think that there is tremendous ambition in climate change. Um, I think it's also about choosing where your best interventions can be made. And the board is basically saying to climate change, we've grown tremendously quickly, even in the European space, in a short period of time, and it's time to consolidate. But I do think that, I think that while the traditional NGOs are oddly very uneasy about lawyers, I'm not entirely sure if it's a cultural thing or what it is, but they are not convinced of the need for lawyers other than the ones they bring <coughs> to do the work that they want to do. But what is certainly becoming clear is that law has a tremendously important role to play across this whole terrain. And the more lawyers come together, and I think it's not just simply about having lots of people in client earth. It's about having powerful relations with the research community, with the practice community, <coughs> with the, the wider knowledge community. Harnessing that, and that's really what attracted me to client earth. The second part of my career, it was to, to bring that kind of knowledge emphasis into a different way of working. And the impact that, that has, I've even just seen in the few months I've done it myself, the impact that I can have Okay, thank you very much everyone for your questions. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions. Um, thank you again, Sharon, very much for your time. <laughs>